episode of Live With, sponsored by SciTech Nutrition. I'm your host, Dave Palumbo, and I'm here with tonight's guest, IFBB Pro, Chris Dim. Welcome, Chris. How are you doing, Dave? Chris, you have a, an amazing story. I mean, you went from top-level IFBB Pro bodybuilder. You stood on the Olympia stage. Um, you had a, uh, I guess you could say, an unfortunate incident that happened to you in the gym where your uh, aorta ruptured, essentially, a, aortic dissection. They repaired that. You made a comeback to the stage. You stepped on the Olympia stage again. And uh, then during a surgery, a subsequent follow-up surgery, uh, you had a spinal cord uh, injury uh, that occurred, deprivation of oxygen, and you found yourself with the inability to use your legs. I know you've been fighting a, a battle for the last three years to try to be able to walk again. Uh, we've talked about this on the radio show with you before. Uh, we want to do a follow-up here because there's some new, been some new progressions and some new opportunities available for you. Fill us in on what's been going on in your life. Well, you know... Um... I would say 99% of the time on my mind, I'm thinking about walking. So uh, no matter what, I'm always trying to train my brain to, to get my legs to move. I'm always doing rehab. I'm always doing something to walk. You know, um, I don't get discouraged by other people. I mean, some people say, well, Chris, you know, um, what happened if you're never able to walk again? You know, I mean, you, you're working so hard on walking, but what happened if you don't, you know? The way I look at it is, guess what? I'm still always getting more movement. So as long as I'm getting more movement, as long as I'm training my legs, as long as I'm pushing forward, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. So so my thing is, is that's all I've been doing the last couple of years since the last time we talked. I'm still working hard. And, uh, you know, there's time when I do get discouraged because the fact that it's not working quick enough, but I'm still seeing results. So um, pain now is going from the belly button down to my knees. Um, I can feel more pain. Um, it seems like it's traveling downward. So all my hard work, I mean, I'm not going to give up. I've never given up since I was a 98-pound wrestler to a bodybuilder, so I'm not going to give up now. Let's, let's take a step back for a minute, um, back to when the initial uh, issue happened, which you were in the gym. I believe you were training people, and you just collapsed, basically. Tell, tell us, for the people who might not have heard the story, explain to us what happened. Yeah. So what happened was in 2007, I was training my clients and it felt like a thousand pounds was going down my chest. Um, and basically I, I, I pretty much collapsed. But at the moment I told my client, Hey, I think this is something really serious. I need you to call the ambulance ASAP. So all I remember was that thousand pound on my chest and I dropped down and I was able to slow my breathing down and try to relax as much as I can because I knew that it was probably something major. And of course it was. And what happened was your, your aorta essentially ruptured. Um, usually that, that results in death. Uh, luckily they were able to get you to the hospital quickly. Uh, what happened once you got to the hospital? Yeah. Once I got to the hospital, honestly, I remember being um, taken in an ambulance. Then all I remember is waking up and, um, Basically, I felt my chest and my chest is pretty much uh, split apart. Um, and I remember coughing and it felt like that chest was going to rip. And uh, that's all I remember. And I remember them telling my family that they gave me a 10% chance to live. They weren't sure if I was going to wake up. And if I was, uh, they think I was going to wake up with brain damage and paralysis put together. But uh, miraculously, that didn't happen. And that's when the... the the rehab began again. What's interesting is that you did you were you conscious when you heard them tell you the, your parents that they only had a, you only had a ten percent chance to live, or were you actually unconscious at the time? I was gone. I didn't know anything until I woke up, and that's what they that's what they uh, told me is uh, that they they thought that I wasn't going to wake up. Now, when you did get up and you did get onto the road to recovery, and you did start getting stronger. And eventually you wound up back in the gym and you started putting back muscle. Um, what was the doctor's prognosis at that point? Were they, were they telling you, hey, you're good now? You're good to go? No, they told me that kiss my career goodbye and I'll never be able to train ever again. Make you feel at the time? At the time, um, like anything else, I mean, I was uh, – 
I was very uh, disappointed. I was uh, uh, basically stressed out at the time. Um, you know, at that moment when they told me that, I, I just didn't know what to think because, you know, of my chest being split apart. But um, I knew that I didn't want to end my career that way. And um, I remember just walking at point A to point B. I was out of breath. I mean, you know, it's like a a 95 year old man trying to walk and you couldn't even take basically 10 steps before I had to sit back down again. Now, how the hell did they actually put your aorta back together once it splits open like that? Do you know? Uh, all basically based on the, the graph that I saw, all they did was they basically connected it back to the heart because obviously the aortas, the first one is connected to the heart. So they had to basically, uh, put a synthetic uh, word in there to basically hold everything together. I got you. Now, uh, you wind up getting back to bodybuilding. You wind up competing at the Dallas Europa Super Show and you come back. You place third. Back then, top three qualifies for the Olympia. You find yourself on the Olympia stage. I mean, that had to be one of the greatest you know, comebacks of all time from what you went through to get back on stage. Were the doctors... I'm sure you were seeing the doctor on and off. Were the doctors not happy with the fact that you got back on stage? Yeah, but he also knew knew my career and he knew what you know what I wanted to do. But I told him I didn't want to end my career that way. And he and to be honest with you, it was a, a, a the biggest accomplishment because of the fact that I didn't want to end my career that way. And I, and I got back on that stage and all I did was I did that the the Olympia was a little off because i was trying to it's like starting all over again and then i did the the sacramento pro in 2009 and and you know they didn't have the 202 in that uh the open show at the sack so and i think there's like 26 28 guys and i took fourth and um i remember uh talking to bob chicarelli and he said you know if you came this type of conditioning um, at the next year, 202, because now it's 212, he said, you know, you, you, you could be up there in top three and you can actually probably win it. But I knew right after the, the, the Sacramento show, and the only reason why I did it is because I wanted to redeem myself and I came in tighter. But uh, right after that, I was ready to retire. I knew that, you know what, I'm, I'm done. It's, it's something that I wanted to come back and I accomplished what I wanted. And uh, that was when I made my retirement. At some point, the doctors came to you and said to you, hey, Chris, we fixed the upper part of your aorta, but the descending, the part that goes down towards your you know, lower body, is also weak. And you decided electively to have a surgery to repair that. Is that correct? Yes. So I came back in 2010, and that's when they did the second portion of the aorta. And um, that was another 15 and a half hour surgery. Were you... Were you, I mean, did they give you odds before you went in and say, hey, you got this much chance of this being a success? And what was the, the reason they did the surgery? Did they really believe that eventually your aorta would rupture down there as well? Yeah, they said, I'm not going to get a second chance. So since they're finding it and it's starting to really expand, um, they want to go ahead and fix that second portion. And uh, they said, if I don't do it, if this rupture, you're not going to survive. Now, was that just, uh, I mean, this, this aorta doesn't, ha uh, dissecting aorta uh, situation doesn't occur to, you know, the majority of the population. Did they say it was just bad luck, bad genetics in that sense? Well, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol runs in my family. My, my mom has it. My dad died from a stroke at 54 from high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, it's just something that was hereditary in my family. And, um, like anything else, Dave, we all think we're invincible when we lift weight. And um, sometimes that invincible of taking things for granted and not going back in there and checking it on a regular base, um, that basically was what caused the, the damage. I think if I would have kept up a lot more, and I always tell the newer generation and even the older guys, I say, hey, go get your blood work done. Go get everything scanned. Make sure you check it on a regular base, you know. Do at least twice a year just to make sure that if you know something's going on, you can try to fix it before anything major can happen. Yeah, very wise words. Uh, so you go in for this elective surgery, and what happens? What, how does the damage occur? Give us the actual uh, turn of events that went on during the surgery. Well, so what happened was I, um, 
they put a stent in. So the third part, the doctor who did my, my second surgery, you know, because they sent me to back to another hospital, which is my primary. And he told he, t he said, don't let him do the stent. Whatever you do, it will not hold up. And um, the doctor talked to me into doing the stent anyway. And so when I did that stent, that's what didn't hold up. And stent is obviously a less invasive surgery. So you figured, let me try that first before they go all out and they try to replace the aorta, right? Yeah. So it was just something that was a, a simple procedure. They didn't have to cut me. Um, so I said, you know what, Let, let's take a chance on it. Go ahead and do it. But then, you know, that's when 2012 happened is when I was, uh, I started sweating really bad. I started feeling chest pain and I knew something was going on and I went in and, you know, I think blood pressure was somewhere around 240, 120 over uh, 240. My God, holy mackerel. And, uh, you know, so you're talking about heart attack. Uh, you're talking about, you know, stroke, whatever you want to call it. And um, that's when they had to do that emergency cut. And they cut me. So, you know, again, this might be a little, you know, whatever you want to call it for bodybuilders, but... When you look at your stomach and half your abs look like, you know, um, like aliens is coming, coming through and the other half is uh, normal. Um, it does mess with you a little bit, but they, they cut me all the way from the back of my lats, through my rib cage, through my beliefs, my serratus, all the way to the front of my stomach. So half of my body, you know, with the bone and everything's been cut. And till this day, you know, you always see a smile on my face, but. You know, I wear the compression shirt because these shirts are the only type of shirt that if I wear a regular cotton shirt, it feels like someone took a hot iron to my skin. Really? It, it's that nerve, nerve pain is just uh, constant. So I try not to think about it and I try to put a compression shirt on. It's, I can still feel it. But, the, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, OK, this is going to be here. Um, I just have to move forward and do what I can. Right. Now, you you had the surgery. Um, you wake up and obviously the doctors have to come and tell you that, that things didn't go exactly as planned. What, what was the first thing you can remember the doctors saying to you? I just remember for two days, they put me in like an ice suit, you know, and they're trying to basically, uh, bring it back. And I couldn't, I didn't, they didn't tell me at the time why I was in this ice suit and I was already drugged up. So I didn't know what was going on. It, it's a suit that um, they put you in and it takes your temperature to, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it, it's cold. It's like ice cold because they wanted to, they wanted to try to pr uh, preserve everything and try to bring everything back. So I remember just being so cold and telling the nurse, hey, please, can you take this off? Can you turn this off? Because I was freezing. And I didn't know why at the time why they did it. But the reason why they did it, because they, they're thinking, OK, if I went ahead and try to preserve everything, maybe that that blood flow might come back. So all I remember is the doctor coming in and he looks like he is almost in tears because, you know, I got to know him pretty well. And he says, you know, Chris, I tried everything and uh, I don't know what happened, um, but you have a spinal cord injury. He saw I'm so sorry. And. That's when I looked at him. I said, you know, doctor, I said, you know, I'm still alive. And you saved my life and I thank you for it because if you didn't do it, I would have been dead. And therefore, you know, thank you. Thank you for saving my life. If this is what I have to deal with is my legs, I'll get through it. I'll walk again. So you had to almost comfort him, it seemed like. Yeah, because, I mean, he said it like surreal because he went down to New York right after he did my surgery. And they had a um, they had um, spinal cord injury and they have uh, sports and spinal cord injury aorta. And uh, he looked up on the screen and guess who picture popped up on the big screen in New York? Yours? <laughs> Mine. Wow. So when he came back the next day after that, that's when he said it was just surreal. He said, I just saw your, your picture on this big screen when they're talking about aorta and, uh, and, and sports medicine. And, uh, he said, I'm just so sorry. He goes, I, I, I don't know what happened. Oh, what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, 
a surgery that you wouldn't think would result in a spinal cord injury did, and you took it so well. Um, you know, you mentioned something to me a little earlier. When you go to rehab, you say you told me that the the physical therapists there always say Chris Dim is never ever in a bad mood in physical therapy. How do you mentally stay so focused and so determined and never let you know life set you back mentally or emotionally? You know, I don't think where I'm at. I always think where I'm going. And so to me, it's where you going that makes the most sense. A lot of people live in, 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 in the past. And I don't believe in living in the past. I believe in basically living in what you really want. And, you know, when you started physical therapy, what was the prognosis in terms of, did, did anyone ever tell you, hey, if you work hard enough, you, you might walk again? Or was the prognosis like, forget about it, kid, you're not going to get any feeling back? You know, I think I, I'm kind of tunnel vision when it comes to a lot of things. And one of them is if someone is telling me something that that I don't want to hear, I'm not going to hear it. If it's something negative, I don't want to hear it. So where I'm at right now, SciFit in Sacramento, there, you know, my friend Mike Terrell, he's, he's, a, he's a bodybuilder himself. Um, you know, they're just so supportive of what I, what I do. And they believe, they believe that, you know, in the same belief that I do. And, and the end results is, you know, being able to get up and just walk what we take for granted. How much feeling, how much movement have you gotten back in your legs over the last three years since the injury? Well, I went from, you can, you know, you can take a knife to my quads and uh, I wouldn't be able to feel it if you cut me open. And uh, now uh, if you pinch my quads, damn it, it's painful. So, <laughs> so I guess that the, the progress is coming back and, you know, like I said, the feelings down to about my knee right now. So it seems like it's traveling downward. Um, hips are getting stronger. Um, I'm able to stabilize myself when I'm when I'm up uh, versus before my hips would be all over the place like a puppet. So there's a lot more strength into the hips. And uh, and now, you know, when I come up, you know, you can feel my glutes actually firing up, which before it wasn't. I mean, I'm watching we're watching some of these uh, physical therapy videos you got up there and I'm watching you leg press and it looks like your glutes and your, your hips are, are moving, you know. Um, where, where is the, I guess, where have you, where is the most deficit that you're experiencing at this point? Um, you know, I'm having a hard time hearing. I don't know what's wrong with this. Hold on. They're down the line. Is it your feet that's the problem? Hold on. I don't know what's going on here. Let's let me let me rephrase. Maybe you can hear me now, Johnny. Can we fix it? All right. Obviously, Chris has uh, been undergoing a lot of therapy um, on a regular basis. He goes, you know, tenaciously. He's been doing this for three years, and there's some new technology out now. And when he when we get him back here, uh, we're gonna have him explain what he's trying to do. Um, there's two machines. One's called the Tech RMD, and another one's called the Rewalk endoskeleton exoskeleton and what it enables a, a person who's got no feeling in their legs to do is stand up essentially and the advantage of standing up and chris is going to explain this to us is that you can put pressure on your legs and when there's pressure on the legs there's blood flow there and when there's blood flow there there's a much greater chance of regaining that nervous control of the muscles down there and that's what chris is, is, is trying to attempt to do now except it's very expensive uh, to buy these two machines and then and then have the therapy to go along with it. So uh, Chris has started a GoFundMe campaign, which uh, uh, I encourage all of you guys out there, if you can relate and have any sympathy or compassion for what Chris has gone through the last three years, if we could get some donations. Now, Chris, I think we got you back, correct? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yeah. Now, Chris, I was explaining what the uh, these two new technologies that have come out that are going to help you in this journey to get back on your feet and, and be able to walk again. And I was explaining, why don't you tell us a little bit about what these two machines do? I, I mentioned the Tech RMD machine and the Rewalk Exoskeleton. What will these two machines enable you to do that you can't do now? Well, you know, it, it's, it's when we're in a wheelchair 
and you're in here and you don't get to stand up like, you know, like normal people, your back stiffens up. You can get sores on your butt if you're not careful, which I've had in the past. Um, there's not a lot of blood flow going to your legs and, and your spine is straight. So therefore there's not blood flow going from your spine to your legs. So the, the tech machine, what it does is it, it stands me up. And the first thing when I tried it on, I was so excited because being a trainer and being in a wheelchair, it's frustrating because you can't spot your client. And, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but so it's frustrating. But now it, with, with the tech, I can get up and I can drive around, but I can spot people because I'm standing up. You know, I'm getting weight bearing to my legs. My back is straight. You know, some of you guys, if you haven't seen my video, you know, I keep hearing other people saying you look like a little kid on, on this machine. But the reason why I was smiling so much is because it allows me to stand up and being able to move around and spot my clients. And to me, that was so, so exciting to me. And the, the rewalk exoskeleton, you know, my friend Arthur, he raised a over $77,000 for that re rewalk. And so, you know, I looked at him going, man, I need to take my ego out of the way. It's been over three and a half years. April will be four years and I can go so much faster. And with the rewalk, what it does, it, it attached to the outside of your legs. As you take step, it helps you take step with it and you, you move around. So basically it's like a robotic legs. And what it does, it's going to create more blood flow in my legs. And it's going to basically, you know, get that mind and, 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 and leg connection to, to start really working again. So that's why those things are so important. So from then to now, guys, I just took my ego out of the way. And I said, you know what? I said, if I'm going to have this, I'm going to have to do something. And I just have to basically get it out there. And to be honest with you, Dave, when, when I text you, you respond right away and you know, I'm not putting anybody underneath the bus. It's very sad in, in the IFBB world that I've hit up a couple of big names and I got no respond back, none at all. And to me, it's like, here's an IFBB family that is hurt. If I had another somebody else, I would want to help them out. And when I reached out to a couple of them, um, I got no respond back whatsoever. So I really appreciate you for, for getting me on the show and being so supportive where I didn't get that much with uh, a lot of other people. And I won't mention no name, throw anybody underneath the bus, but I'm very disappointed in that. I will. Not now, but I will throw them under the bus because that's what I do. But uh, the bottom line is that, Chris, if I had the money, I'd write you a check for the whole thing. That's because I know what you've gone through. I can relate to it. I have compassion for what you're going through. No one should. No one who's ever bodybuilded before and has been on a, on a com very – elite competitive level should ever have to go through what Chris has gone through because when you take away the one thing that you love and you're passionate about it, it, it some people just can't recover from that I bet you most people probably would never be where you are today and you know some people might have ended it all but you have the uh, the fire inside your heart and I and I can sense it and I feel it and I I inspire and I and I and I and I implore people to go to the GoFundMe campaign the links up on the on the page is GoFundMe slash Chris Dim and and even if you donate five dollars you know what if every person out there who's listening to this show donated five dollars. Chris would have enough money to buy these pieces of equipment. And I have no doubt in my mind that Chris will walk one day. I know it. I can feel it in my gut. And I know this guy will not stop. Now, Chris, with these, these machines, what they basically enable you to do is it's like you have a personal trainer there or you have your own physical therapist around your legs 24-7. And if I know you, you'll probably be running marathons in these, in these machines. How, uh, once you purchase them, uh, do they, are they mobile? Do they come around with you? Yeah, with um, with the the um the tech machine, once once I buy it, it's mine. So um, you know, but then with the with the rewalk, you have to have forty hours with them before you get to take it home and and uh, be on your own with it because they want to make sure that you're safe with it and you know they trust you with it and so forth. It's kind of like driving a car, I guess. Oh. The, how much money do you totally need to raise with the, with the training and the two machines? What what's the goal number we're looking for? I'm I'm pulling a miracle, you know, out of my butt. But I mean, I I, I put a hundred and forty five thousand dollar because the fact that 
with the rehab, with everything that I need, plus the the, the art, the tech machine, and the exoskeleton alone, you're talking about over a hundred thousand dollar. So you know, and then the 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 other money is just for recovery from rehabbing and everything that I do. I mean, um, I'm not um, proud to admit it, but when all this happened at the same time, I had to humble myself and move in with my mom. And uh, let me tell you, I haven't been out of the house since I was 17. So um, having to humble myself and go back there and, and, you know, everything that I work hard for, man, I just seemed like it just, it all disappeared. But, you know, I've always believed that when you build it again for the third time, um, it'll be rooted and uh, everything happens for a reason. And I just believe that God always have a bigger plan for you if you believe. Yeah. I am. Um... When I got divorced, I had to move back with my dad, which was almost a punishment worse than death. So I could completely relate to what you're going through in that respect. But you know what? Anyone out there who's listening, I know we have a lot of people going to watch this. Probably thousands and thousands of people will watch this live with special. You know what, everyone? Give up lunch for the day. Take your 10 bucks, your $15 you spend on lunch, and go to the Gun GoFundMe campaign and donate it to Chris Dim's uh, journey to walk again. I promise you. If everyone out there just did it, everyone listening who did it, who loves this show and loves to see these interviews we do, donated $15 to Chris Dim. We wouldn't have any problems, and Chris will be more than thankful, and I guarantee you it'll, it'll, it'll come back to you tenfold. Uh, I intend after the show is over to go uh, place my donation. And, uh, Chris, I want to wish you the best of luck in this journey. And once again, I, I, I said it before three years ago, you got to keep us updated on all your – uh, accomplishments and what's been going on with the rehab because the RX muscle audience wants to know how you're doing. They want to see you get up and walk again. Please don't be a stranger. Yeah. You know what, Dave, I appreciate everything that you do and with RX muscle having me on and just remember, it's always ways of playing it forward. So to me, if I can get this thing done, I'm going to play it forward to somebody else because at the end of the day, you're on this earth to do one thing, and that's to help other people. So other than that, guys, you know, I love you for having me on the show, Dave. Let you go. I would, uh, my fans would not uh, forgive me if I didn't ask you this because I've been watching some of these videos you've been doing. I noticed that your arms are still looking pretty damn good. You want to give us <laughs> a, a little arm shot? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't even measure him because I'm afraid to. <laughs> Unbelievable, Chris. <laughs> well, you know what? You're lucky you got those m my monstrous triceps. I'm sure you have no problem getting up out of that chair. That's for sure with those things. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful and blessed that I can get in my car. I can drive my car with the hand control. I had to learn how to do that. Um, put my wheelchair in my own car. Because when I go to rehab and I see these people from the neck down who cannot move, who uh, see injury, and um, having people with them 24 hours a day, I feel blessed. You know, it's always that saying, there's a guy who's got no, uh, no shoes. He didn't appreciate until he had made a guy that had no legs. So to me, you know, um, I, I'm blessed in so many ways. And, and, you know, I, I'm just grateful that I can keep moving along and, and hopefully inspire somebody else and, you know, uh, along the way. Well, good luck, and uh, guys, head over to GoFundMe slash Chris Dim and donate your money. For now, though, we're out of time. Until next week, uh, we are here with Live With, sponsored by SciTech Dentition. I'm Dave Palumbo, signing off.